It's Wednesday, the 6th of July, and we're at the height of a Westminster psychodrama. Boris Johnson's duplicity in office is catching up with him. I'm happy to set on the record now that when I said, I came to this house and said in all sincerity that the rules and guidance had been followed uh, at all times, it was what I believed to be true. The parties, the wallpaper, the peerages. Did you lie at the dispatch box, Prime Minister? And now, the final straw. A cover-up of alleged sexual assaults by one of his MPs. On Friday, number 10 said that the Prime Minister knew no specifics about Chris Pincher's alleged behaviour when he made him Deputy Chief Whip. Today, number 10 said the Prime Minister was aware of reports and speculation about Mr Pincher. By noon, at Prime Minister's questions, it becomes clear that the game is up. Anyone quitting now after defending all that hasn't got a shred of integrity. Mr Speaker, isn't this the first recorded case of the sinking ships fleeing the rat? But the pressure on Boris Johnson doesn't stop there. A few hours later, he's in front of the Liaison Committee, a group of MPs that gets to question the Prime Minister once a year. It is terrible timing for Johnson, because it turns out to be here, in front of these MPs, that we get a moment, in all the noise, that really matters. Could you just confirm, and I just appreciate a yes or a no, that you met with the former KGB officer, Alexandra Lebanov, uh, Lebedev, when you were Foreign Secretary without officials on the 28th of April 2018? Well, uh, I, I, I'd, have to, I, I'd have to check, but... Uh, well, that's, Are you having that, a lapse of memory again? That, no, but that sounds... But, you know, if you're, you're asking me a very specific question... About Boris Johnson might find the meeting hard to recall, but I know exactly what the MP is asking him about. It's a story... I reported last month in my investigation, Londongrad, a self-inflicted breach in Britain's national security, the kind it hasn't seen in over 50 years. Boris Johnson met the ex-KGB officer turned oligarch Alexander Lebedev at Lebedev's Palazzo in Italy. It was soon after the Skripal poisonings in Salisbury in 2018, back when Johnson was foreign secretary. He went to the palazzo without his officials or his close protection officers. And while Boris Johnson was there, Alexander Lebedev tried setting up a direct, unmonitored call between the foreign secretary and the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, to discuss the Skripal case. I've been reporting on Johnson's relationship with the Lebedev family for months now. It started with an episode of this podcast, the slow newscast, called Lord of Siberia, back in March. I described how Johnson sent Evgeny Lebedev, Alexander's son, to the House of Lords. I, Evgeny Lord Lebedev, do solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that I will be faithful... And bear against the advice of the security services. Since then... I've shown how the Lebedevs used parties, newspapers and politicians to accelerate their rise to the heart of the British establishment and how, at every step of the way on their 14-year journey, security concerns were brushed aside. But this meeting with Alexander Lebedev in Italy in April 2018 is something that Boris Johnson has never admitted to. Until now. This isn't simply about impropriety or bluster. It's about something else. Something more concerning. The Foreign Secretary secretly met with a man allied to Vladimir Putin just weeks after the Kremlin conducted a chemical attack in Salisbury and then followed it up with cyber attacks on the Foreign Office. That was one of the most serious national security events to have taken place on British soil in recent times. The, the, the point is that this scenario is one which is extremely potentially compromising to both Johnson personally and also the country and its interests, and that's why we need to get to the bottom of it. I'm Paul Caruana Galizia, 
and in this episode of the Slow Newscast, the story that may come to define Boris Johnson's legacy more than the parties, the wallpaper or the sex. Back at the Liaison Committee, a tired-looking Boris Johnson is staring down a semicircle of senior MPs. He's not asking that question. Well, I don't know quite what... You know exactly what I'm asking. You you, you don't... This is all about you in the end. The reason these things happen is because of you. He took liberties because he knows that you take liberties and get away with it. This type of scrutiny couldn't have come on a worse day for the Prime Minister. When the Labour MP Diana Johnson asks a question about Alexander Lebedev and that meeting on the 28th of April 2018, it looks like it comes as a surprise to him. His eyes dart around and he fumbles for an answer. But that sounds, but you know, if you're, you're asking me a very specific question about a very specific date, and I, really, I, I, I would have to, I'd have to get back. I certainly have met the gentleman in question who's uh, who's uh, uh, who, who used to be the proprietor of the London Evening Standard? I, when, I was, uh, when I was mayor of London. Evgeny, his son, still owns the Evening Standard. Alexander resigned all his UK directorships only very recently because the Canadian government sanctioned him as someone who, it said, directly enabled Vladimir Putin's senseless war in Ukraine and bears responsibility for the pain and suffering of the people of Ukraine. It's a characterization that Alexander Lebedev has denied. But in the reporting I've done, much of it before Canada's designation, I found that Alexander Lebedev became rich thanks to his KGB past, that he supported Putin's annexation of Crimea, where he has investments, and that Britain's security services have long been uneasy about him so have security services elsewhere. A report by Italy's external intelligence and security agency claims that Alexander invested in property with individuals linked to the Camorra and Indrangheta mafia clans, and that he enjoys, in its words, the favour and friendship of Vladimir Putin. And not just Putin's favour and friendship, but Boris Johnson's too. A few days after one of Johnson's first lunches with Evgeny Lebedev, the then mayor of London wrote to Evgeny Lebedev, saying he'd be thrilled if the Evening Standard and Independent covered some of his mayoral projects. His team, he added, was all set to make a presentation to Geordie. That's Geordie Gregg, the Standard's editor. When Evgeny Lebedev agreed, Boris Johnson wrote back with Your support and that of the Evening Standard is much appreciated. Just eight days before London's mayoral election in May 2012, the Evening Standard ran a front-page editorial with the headline Boris Johnson, the right choice for London. Boris Johnson was re-elected, narrowly, with 51.5% of the vote. Tomorrow we continue with our work, but tonight we will celebrate sensible, cost-effective, conservative administration in London over the next four years with a non-taxpayer-funded libation. Thank you very, very much, everybody. It was in October that year that Boris Johnson made his first visit to Palazzo Terranova, the Lebedev's villa nestled in the Umbrian hills. For the decade that followed, Alexander and Evgeny Lebedev cultivated an increasingly close relationship with Boris Johnson. They invited him to their parties in London and Italy, where he drank, danced with Evgeny Lebedev, did karaoke to ABBA in a wig, and one time sat near Katie Price, an event I reported on in my series London Grad. When, as usual, Evgeny expected all his guests to stand up and give a toast to him, he tried passing over Katie Price. 
To her enormous credit, she stood up, and all the other guests looked down awkwardly. Katie Price said people usually only wanted one thing from her. She said, You all want to see them, don't you? Then she lifted her top to expose her breasts, turned to Britain's foreign secretary, and told him, They're like granite. Their relationship reached a peak when Boris Johnson gave Evgeny Lebedev a seat for life in the House of Lords. The security services had advised against it because of his father's KGB past. So I, 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 I'm certainly not going to deny having met uh, Alexander Lebedev. I, I certainly have. As far as, far as I remember, uh, he used to own uh, the London Evening Standard. Yes, but with officials when you were foreign secretary. Did you meet with officials or without officials? Look, I, I, I've certainly met him without officials. Right. And, uh, you know, as I say, he's a... He's a perhaps you could write a, to us... Pr- with proprietor of a... Of perhaps a perhaps you could write to us with a specific very answer. Ha- very happy to... to a very happy specific to... Specific answer to that very specific question. But Boris Johnson is still dodging that very specific question. Because this meeting is different from the other trips he made to Italy. We know almost everything about those other parties... They happened in October and have been, by now, reported out. This trip was in April. It was in April 2018, just weeks after the Skripal poisonings and when Boris Johnson, as foreign secretary, was meant to be managing relations with the Kremlin. Let me immediately say there is much speculation about the disturbing incident in Salisbury, where a 66-year-old man, Sergei Skripal, and his 33-year-old daughter, Yulia, were found unconscious outside the Maltings shopping centre on Sunday afternoon. Police, together with partner agencies, are now investigating. The attack was conducted by Russian military intelligence officials in March 2018. They used Novichok, a military-grade nerve agent. They failed to kill their target, Sergei Skripal, a former Russian spy. But the trail of poison they left behind later killed a British citizen, Dawn Sturgis. On Friday, 27 April 2018, Boris Johnson flew to a NATO foreign minister summit in Brussels. It was the first meeting of its kind since the Skripal poisonings. At the meeting, he urged his counterparts to do more to tackle Russia's malign influence around the world. And then he flew to Italy to meet Alexander Lebedev at his Palazzo Terranova and spent the weekend there. One source says that Alexander Lebedev wanted to provide a direct, unmonitored line between Boris Johnson and Sergei Lavrov, Russia's foreign minister, to discuss the Skripal case. There are, of course, no formal records of this, but the account is supported by three other people who are each in their own way connected to the Foreign Office. One says it was representative of Boris Johnson's chummy approach to foreign policy. For Alexander Lebedev, it was an opportunity to show his value and importance to the Kremlin. If it had been set up officially from London, that kind of call would have been carefully thought through and closely monitored. In any case, the call, which Alexander Lebedev has denied setting up, never happened. Boris Johnson drank heavily the night before and overslept. His visit would end up in the British newspapers because he was spotted at Perugia Airport on the Sunday. No luggage crumpled suit, curved walk. Everyone who saw him immediately assumed he was completely hungover. At the airport, he was alone, which is strange. In Boris Johnson's register of hospitality, he declared that he went there with a spouse, a family member or friend. So who was it? And why didn't they return with him? And why didn't he log his meeting with Alexander Lebedev in the Foreign Office's Register of Ministers' Meetings? Back at the Liaison Committee, 
Labour's Meg Hillier jumps on Boris Johnson's evasive answer. I mean, you said you met her without officials. Was that presumably was when you were mayor of London? When you were foreign secretary, did you meet Alexander Lebedev? I, I, I think uh, I probably officials? did, but I but um, probably did. I, I, as I said, I would like, I would need to check. You, you used to regularly meeting him. I mean, is it probably because you meet him often, or probably because you can't remember? I'm watching this live in the daughter's newsroom, holding my breath, feeling anxious that he may deny it, or that he may finally cave in. I, I've met him on a very few occasions. As foreign uh, when, secretary. When, 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 uh, if the, on the occasion you're mentioning, if that was when I was foreign secretary, then yes. Without officials? Yes, I mean, that, that makes sense. Did you report yes. to your officials that you had met him? Uh, I, think I, I think I did mention it, yes. It is an extraordinary admission, and to me, frankly, a relief. But the drama doesn't stop there. As the questions continue, there's something that catches my eye. Where did you meet him? Um, you know, uh, I, Two I men to... are sitting behind Boris Johnson, looking deeply uncomfortable. One is James Dudridge, MP, his parliamentary private secretary. The other is a civil servant. His eyes are closed. As the Prime Minister starts to answer, the man's eyes snap open. He slowly, deliberately, writes a note on a piece of paper, circles it, and passes the paper forward. But not in time to stop the Prime Minister from talking. Uh, I, I met him uh, in Italy, as it happens, but I, I really, you know, I, I forget. Anyway. His one secret, undocumented meeting with a former KGB officer is now in the public record. And my phone starts ringing. People, myself included, want to know who Boris Johnson went to Italy with, what he discussed with Alexander Lebedev there, what the Foreign Office knew or didn't know. They want to know whether Britain's national security was put at risk by its own foreign secretary. So I make some calls. Peter Ricketts is a former UK national security advisor. He was a diplomat for 40 years and also chaired the Joint Intelligence Committee, a cabinet office body that advises ministers on security issues. He's now in the House of Lords. So could we start with the, the Prime Minister's appearance before the Liaison Committee on, on Wednesday? Did you watch it? Yes, I, I watched the part relating to his meeting with uh, Alexander Lebedev. I thought it was an extraordinary performance overall, um, and that revelation was um, particularly surprising and to me rather shocking. And the fact that it has taken so long to get him to confirm on the record that that happened um, uh, leaves me uh, amazed, really. Uh, and so I thought it was a very effective piece of parliamentary scrutiny that uh, confirmed something which had been rumoured but which is now fully on the record. Can, Peter, because, because you were in, at the Foreign Office for, for so many years, if, if a Foreign Secretary came to you and, and suggested a meeting like this, what, what would your advice have been? I would have said that that was extremely risky, um, very dangerous for the Minister's own reputation, uh, and an irresponsible thing to do in that climate of the time. So I would have said that I really would advise very strongly against doing that. I asked a former Foreign Secretary's Chief of Staff how things would have been handled in their time, a recent Conservative government. Here's what they told me. First, the Foreign Secretary would have never met someone like Alexander Lebedev or used a personal line for a call like this. He'd have known that it's not possible or acceptable to arrange meetings outside official channels and without civil servants present. If a foreign secretary received a request to meet someone like Alexander Lebedev, the first thing they'd do is inform their private office, which would then inform the permanent secretary and relevant desk at the foreign office and any other agencies that might need to be involved. The ambassador of the country concerned would also normally be told and the civil servant would attend the meeting, even if it were outside the Foreign Office. 
the civil servant would write a minute of the meeting that would then be circulated to those who needed to see it. If it were classed as a political meeting, that is a meeting in some other capacity related to politics and not government, then the foreign secretary would meet them with a special advisor present. Everything has to be recorded. There should always be witnesses. How far things have slipped in just a couple of years. The day after the liaison committee, another Labour MP, Yvette Cooper, the Shadow Home Secretary, tables an urgent question in the House of Commons. The charges against the Prime Minister are not just about lack of integrity, they are about complete disregard for basic national security and the patriotic interests of this country. And those charges lie not just with the Prime Minister, but with all of those who have enabled him and covered up for him on this issue. This time, Boris Johnson isn't there to answer for himself. Vicky Ford, a Foreign Office Minister, is. It is bad enough covering up for parties and breaking the law, but covering up over national security is a total disgrace. It puts all our safety and security at risk. It's not just the Prime Minister, it is the whole government that is letting the country down. But she doesn't provide much clarity. In fact, things become more of a mess. Vicky Ford says that the Prime Minister reported his meetings with Alexander Lebedev to officials as required. But as the Labour MP Chris Bryan points out, That's not what Boris Johnson said. If he'd done that, the meeting would have appeared on the transparency records. So either um, she has misled us inadvertently today or the Prime Minister um, did so perhaps more deliberately previously. Vicky Ford is forced to clarify. I have just been passed a note uh, that apparently the Prime Minister says that he thinks he mentioned this meeting to officials. It's not just who was told what, and when, that's still unclear. Yvette Cooper also raises something that's cropped up in conversations I've been having. The record of ministers' interest says the foreign secretary accepted hospitality in Italy for himself and a guest, but he travelled home alone. Who was that guest, and did that put him in a compromising position? I originally thought that Boris Johnson went alone, and that the entry in the register was wrong, because he returned from that trip alone. But now, I'm really not so sure. One theory is that he took Carrie Johnson, who was then Carrie Simmons. They had begun seeing each other secretly at least two months before the trip. If this is the case, then the risk is clear. A former KGB officer, at a time when relations between Britain and Russia had fallen to their lowest point, hosted the foreign secretary and his then lover. A relationship that Boris Johnson had tried to keep hidden but came out into the open a few months later. It hands to a hostile foreign power the potential for blackmail, or at least leverage. But Carrie Johnson's PR agent denies that she was present on this trip. Another persistent rumour is that Boris Johnson was accompanied by another young woman and with whom he had another affair. When I put this to Downing Street, I got a call from Gito Harry, the Prime Minister's Director of Communications. Gito Harry told me that he took this claim to the Prime Minister, who vehemently denies it. If you publish this, he told me, then the Prime Minister will sue and you can be the first to contribute to his retirement fund. I don't need to tell you, he continued, how substantial damages will be. When I asked why they can't just tell me who was with him, when we know so much about all his relationships and parties anyway, and why this one in particular is so secret, Gito Harry told me there's no public interest in who someone got on a flight with. Let's not pretend, he said. This is not about the public interest, It's a voyeuristic obsession with his sex life. When I said that Boris Johnson was the foreign secretary, Gito Harry said, so what? I really disagree. I think it matters. I wouldn't be interested in Boris Johnson's complicated personal life if he hadn't been one of the most senior cabinet ministers with direct responsibility for handling Russia at a time when the Kremlin was killing people in Britain. Yeah, I think, I think the timing of it, of course, it comes 
pretty much immediately after the um, Skripal attack and absolutely completely after um, a meeting, I think, in, in NATO to discuss the response to that attack. And that, that was one of the most serious national security events to have taken place on British soil in recent times. Chris Steele is a former MI6 officer. He ran the security agency's Russia desk. I asked him what he thought about Boris Johnson's meeting with Alexander Lebedev. So I think the implications are very serious. I don't know what was what transpired at that meeting, and I don't know whether there was a a phone call uh, to Lavrov on the agenda and whether that took place or not. But that's not really the point. The, the, the point is that this scenario is one which is extremely potentially compromising to both Johnson personally and also the country and its interests. And that's why we need to get to the bottom of it. And does this, this meeting surprise you about, uh, about Johnson? Is it a surprising thing for him to have done? From our point of view, given the office he was holding at the time, I think that that's the that's the real concern. It's a very sensitive office. It's obviously an office which t- determines, to quite an extent, relations with Russia and other foreign powers. Um, and yeah, we, we we need to understand exactly what was going on here. This is not an isolated event. In your um career have have you ever encountered anything like this no frankly um on any number of counts but certainly not um the italy scenario as it's now emerging i asked peter ricketts the same question had he ever come across anything like this before in his career this is unprecedented in my experience Um, i have known of occasions where foreign ministers go off for a week on holiday and the protection is done by the local uh, security authorities. But I cannot think of an occasion where a foreign secretary without anyone accompanying him at all went and had a weekend with someone in an influential position with a sensitive security background at a time of um, real tension with the country concerned, Russia, uh, uh, at that time. So I think that combination of circumstances Um, is unprecedented in my experience. And for good reason, because it's for the protection of foreign secretaries that there's an official or a special advisor with them so that nobody can give a misleading account of what may or may not have been said. So now now that we the meeting has been confirmed by the Prime Minister himself, what, what do you think needs to happen now or should happen now? Should there be some kind of inquiry, for example, or do we need more clarity from the Prime Minister himself? Well, I think the first thing that it would be important to know is whether the Prime Minister did report the meeting back to Foreign Office officials and whether there is an official report of that meeting. I mean, beyond that, I think, you know, it's for those in um, government now to decide how much further they want to press this Um, whether there was any risk of anything having been said there that ought to be on the public record. Um, But let's at least establish whether anything is there now. Uh, If not, then, you know, ideally, yes, Mr Johnson would give some fuller account of what it was that he discussed with Mr Lebedev at that meeting. Chris Steele goes further. What do you think should happen now, now that we do know about the meeting? There are some very unorthodox and strange elements to all this. And it needs to be properly investigated by the, the relevant authorities, which in this case is definitely the security service. It's a view taken by the Labour Party, which is gunning for a full investigation. Angela Rayner, the party's deputy leader, told me that Boris Johnson poses an ongoing threat to national security. If he is found to have breached the national security protocols that are there to keep us all safe, he has no option but to leave his office immediately and face the full consequences of the law. It's an absolute red line. She questioned whether the Prime Minister took papers with him from NATO to the meeting, whether his phone could have been compromised, and the risk posed by an undeclared and unidentified guest. Questions that, like so much else, remain unanswered by Boris Johnson and his government. At the start of this episode, I described the April 2018 meeting between Boris Johnson and Alexander Lebedev 
as a self-inflicted breach in Britain's national security, one that the country hasn't seen in over 50 years. At a party at the country estate of Lord Astor in 1961, then British Secretary of State for War, John Profumo, a youngish rising Tory, met the 19-year-old dancer Christine Keeler. While Christine Keeler was involved with the Soviet Union's military attaché in London, she began an affair with John Profumo. At 11 a.m. in the House of Commons, Mr. John Profumo makes a personal statement. Miss Keeler and I were on friendly terms. There was no impropriety whatsoever in my acquaintanceship with Miss Keeler. When it emerged in 1963, John Profumo first lied about it to Parliament, but was then forced to resign. He writes to the Prime Minister, I misled you and my colleagues in the House. I cannot remain a member of your administration, nor of the House of Commons. The Prime Minister followed. The government collapsed. A senior judge conducted a report into the Profumo affair. He found that there had been no security leaks. The judge said John Profumo was only guilty of an indiscretion. But no one could doubt his loyalty. Could we say the same of Boris Johnson? Were there leaks? Was he loyal? Was he compromised? Here's what we do know. In the wake of the Skripal poisonings, Johnson met a former KGB officer without any officials or security detail who was trying to provide an unofficial line to the Kremlin. But looking back, there are even more questions. Why did Boris Johnson delay the release of Parliament's Russia report, which examined the Kremlin's malign influence in Britain? Why was he so insistent on giving Evgeny Lebedev, the former KGB officer's son, a peerage? Boris Johnson is now, maybe, on his way out. But these questions will hang over not just him, but Britain, until we get answers. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Slow Newscast. It was reported by me, Paul Caruana Galizia, and produced by Claudia Williams. The editor was Basha Cummings. Sound design is by Studio Cologne.